Monday, 16 minutes after 7 o'clock, Dr. Rakesh Mohanlal joins us to discuss the cutting-edge cardiovascular treatment and diagnostic techniques of external counterpulsation and 3D, that's three-dimensional vasculography. Right, so let's get this correct. I'll ask Dr. Mohanlal to explain all of this. Uh, it's external counterpulsation and three-dimensional vasculography. Dr. Mohanlal is a doctor of clinical technology specializing in cardiovascular perfusion and non-invasive medicine. He holds 22 years of experience in the cardiac field. He attained the first master's to doctorate conversion at Durban University of Technology, becoming the first perfusionist with a doctorate in cardiovascular perfusion for bypass surgery. He trained in South Africa, Saudi Arabia, the Netherlands, India and China and has featured as a guest speaker on various platforms nationally and internationally. He's the chief executive officer of South African External Counterpulsation and CEO of the Center for Advanced Medicine where the first and only state-of-the-art non-invasive cardiac diagnostic machine is housed on the African continent. And for the next... 43 minutes is live on the radio with me on Lotus FM. Dr. Mohanlal, welcome back to the studio. Nice to see you. Thank you, Alan. Good evening to you and all this. Stuff. It's been about three years since you were last year. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Thanks for having me back. It's good to see you smiling. I remember, you know, the, the first show that we did back in, uh, I think, uh, 2014. Lots of people calling in because it was new technology, uh, non-invasive cardio um, uh, procedures that you were performing. So I think... Even though we've chatted about this, let's just rewind a bit and uh, explain what is external counterpulsation and then three-dimensional vasculography. And we'll talk about then how it can help us and uh, assist in prolonging life and and treating angina and and the like. I think it will be a good idea to recap if you want to. Okay, so let's start with that. Maybe just explain in terms of external counterpulsation. Well, external counterpulsation is a treatment for patients suffering from high blood pressure, uh, diabetes, coronary artery disease, uh, who suffer from chest pain, shortness of breath, on exertion or even on rest. And it's a non-invasive approach for um, attaining the same results you would get or better in some of the in some cases as invasive procedures such as bypass surgery or right. stent insertion. So, so by non-invasive we mean they're non-surgical procedures, you're not cutting into the body. That's right, there's no needles, no dyes, no radiation that the patient's exposed to. And you mentioned patients who suffer from hypertension, which is high blood pressure, diabetes, um, there's a significant portion of the South African population who are just struggling with those two diseases, right? Yeah, that's very true. I mean, it's becoming com- a common phenomenon now to see a large part of our population that have these um, sicknesses or illnesses and maybe it's just our way of life that's that's gearing us or Mm -hmm. pushing us towards these uh, pathologies so you can understand that uh, hypertension will have an impact on the whole cardiovascular system and eventually the heart how does diabetes you know negatively affect our heart yeah the thing is what what are we afraid of by being diabetic if somebody had to say we are diabetic what what is the frightening part about it Mm. Um, it basically means that you cannot your body doesn't have the ability to control the amount of glucose that's circulating in your bloodstream. Right. But what happens is glucose that is unused literally forms something like what we'd call a tumbleweed that has a great sandpapering effect on the intima or the inside of your blood vessels. So the tumble, tumbleweed would be the stuff that they use in the movies, right? Which is like <laughs> balls of hay. <laughs> that's right. That, that blow in the wind. <laughs> that's right. So, so, so we have this kind of effect inside, in our... the, inside the lumen of your artery. So it creates the perfect sandpapering device that actually damages the intima, which is the inner layer of the artery. So it doesn't scrape off the plaque from the blood vessels, the wall? Actually, it'll be one of the reasons that plaque forms on the blood vessel, because when this happens on a continuous basis, what would happen is cholesterol, which is the good guy in the body, contrary right. to what we know. Or well, good cholesterol, right? Well, all cholesterol is good in the okay. body. I don't think anything that your creator has, has allowed to manifest in your body has something bad in it, okay. even your perspiration. There's a reason for it. There's a very good okay. reason for it, and one of it is the protective layer on your skin. So to I suppose you from infection. And I know we're going off a tangent, but I suppose you're in the corner of anti-statins as a preventative. Uh, I don't think we should be anti-anything. Right. I think we should look at the positive and the negative aspects of it. If the benefits outweigh the the risks, then I think we should go for it. But if the risks outweigh the benefits, then I think it's something to take seriously into consideration before prescribing a drug like that to a patient. Okay. So you were when we uh, when I interrupted you rather you were explaining <laughs> about uh, external counter pulsation. So it's non-invasive? Mm-hmm. It's non-invasive. What happens is the patient lies on the bed. We um, strap them with a system of uh, cuffs, like blood pressure cuffs, that's connected to your body's ECG. So it's not a massage machine per se. Right. The machine knows exactly when your heart beats, when it stops, when the valves of your heart open, when it closes. It's syncing with your ECG. So the machine works according to your heart rate. 
it increases and decreases its pace according to your heart rate. So during diastole, which is a, a relaxation phase of the heart, it will increase blood flow sequentially from your calves, thighs, and your hip regions to every part of the body, thereby reversing some of the um, abnormalities that occurred because of diabetes, which we spoke about just now, which is damage to the intima. Right. What happens when you damage an artery, it loses elasticity. When it loses elasticity, el- elasticity this is known as arteriosclerosis. Now, we've been fed with the information that the most important thing for us to focus on is atherosclerosis, which is narrowing of an artery due to plaque, because that's where we can sell medications. But a precursor to this is arteriosclerosis. It's a loss of elasticity of blood vessels throughout your body. So before the hardening comes the loss of elasticity. That's right, because your blood vessels in your body equate to 68,000 miles. Uh, it's hard for one to actually visualize that. That's actually two times around the Earth's circumference. So your your blood vessels will be your veins and arteries? Right? Veins, arteries, capillaries, arterioles. Right, okay. So what happens is you lose elasticity because of age, which you can't help. Genetic factors, mm-hmm. which are hereditary factors. Smoking in some people, stress in some people, loss of um, or lack of exercise, mm-hmm. poor eating habits, inflammation, such as a simple thing like uh, periodontal disease, which you cannot feel. That's why it's important to see a dentist very often. Uh, things like sinusitis, which cause localized inflammation, which then causes generalized inflammation, which causes loss of elasticity of these blood vessels. So gum if, disease mm-hmm. could, could lead to cardiovascular issues? Very seriously. And, and simple thing like sinusitis, which is a very common problem in today, especially with the amount of industrialization that's happening around us. Yeah. We are breathing in all this dust and this localized inflammation that's occurring in your nasal passages. If we don't flush that out using some, uh, uh, a saline rinse or a simple things like a neti pot to flush out your, your sinuses, you would basically get inflammation that will cause arteriosclerosis and microvessel disease, which will eventually lo- lead to heart disease or blocking of your arteries due to cholesterol. Which means you are in line for either a stent or a bypass. That's right, uh, which, if you're lucky. Which is... Um a difficult procedure, although successful, right? Lots of people have bypasses and That's true, the yeah. success rate is, is, is pretty high. Well, I, I don't, it just depends how one quantifies success. I've been part of the bypass team for 18 years. Right. Um, Are more people surviving bypass well, operations and passing it, on? Did the patient come in dead? Because that's a question to ask. Because success is based on something you've achieved that you did right. not have. So if you were dead and you came in and you're now alive, then that's success. But if you came in alive and you went, underwent such a an invasive procedure and came back alive, would you call that success? Well, I, you know, every time I walk out of the hospital, you, you call know, that success. smiling, <laughs> breathing and happy, that's, that's success. True. That's success, Rakesh. That's one of the things that, uh, that uh, motivated me to ask yeah. these questions internationally because uh, we, let's take the analogy of a car. Right. If your car had to be, when you bought your car, it could reach 180 kilometers an hour. And today now it goes at 60 kilometers an hour. You take it to a mechanic and you say, you know what, my car is only doing 60. He repairs your car, gives it back to you, your car does 70. And success. You, when you go back to him, you say, my car is only doing 70. Then he's going to tell you that, you know what, this is what I've done. I've stripped the engine. I've put in new rings and bearings. I've, all the intricate spanners that he's used to achieve your car moving again is what he's done to achieve that success that he's given you. Would you identify this or, or evaluate this as success? Well, it's been invasive, isn't it? Yeah. So, But the end product is your car is only moving 5 to 10 kilometers more than you, you gave it into him to as. So the question is, success can only be deemed success when there's a significant difference in what a patient felt before and what he feels after. A patient goes to a doctor not because he has a 10% or or 90% stenosis of an artery. A patient goes to a doctor because he's feeling chest pains, he has shortness of breath, he has poor quality of life. What he expects to attain after an invasive or non-invasive procedure Mm. is that he should have no chest pains or little chest pain. He should be able to walk a long distance. He should be able to have a good quality of life with a low dependency on medication. So if we have not achieved any of these factors, how can we deem it a success? Okay, the fascinating voice of Dr. Rakesh Mohanlal tonight. We're talking about your heart, focusing on some non-invasive procedures. He's mentioned diabetes, hypertension. We're going to talk about angina. We'll also open up the lines so you can call in to get some free expert advice from Dr. Mohanlal tonight. Uh, we'll take a handful of calls because there's just so much to go through. So we won't flood the lines on 089-310-8789. Enrico's busy manning the line. So any questions you have for our heart expert in studio this evening, Dr. Rakesh Mohanlal, we're focusing on external counterpulsation. We'll talk about three-dimensional vasculography. And as I said, um, it's a very interesting uh, discussion we're going to have because there's a lot of new technology which has been around, but sadly, 
uh, it's not scattered all over the, the, the continent, let alone the country. So um, Durban certainly has a center, and Dr. Mohanlal will uh, share details with us, and I'll give you a contact number just before we wrap up tonight. And at this stage, uh, he's uh, one of uh, a handful of people who has the knowledge, expertise, and, of course, the equipment, uh, which is performing some of these miracles. So you can call right now on 089 to speak to Dr. Mohanlal. So external counterpulsation, what kind of patients will be viable to come and see you for external counterpulsation? Well, patients who, <clears throat> as I said, have problems with high blood pressure, diabetes, um, coronary artery disease, symptoms of chest pains, shortness of breath, uh, patients who basically underwent a stroke recently. We find we have the best results in stroke patients if we treat them within the first two or three months of the stroke. Amazingly, we've just finished two patients, patients last month, and uh, both of them came in with a wheelchair and are walking absolutely fine now. One of them is actually 83 years old. Wow. So they arrive on a wheelchair, they survive their stroke, mm -hmm. and they leave after the treatment walking. Yeah, that's the amazing part, you know, and uh, to be part of the group of people that help achieve this is absolutely um, fascinating. I, I cannot uh, explain the, the pleasure it gives me to see somebody walk out of there when they come in with the wheelchair. So three-dimensional vasculography. Hmm? Sounds like a movie theater. What is that? <laughs> well, most of the technologies that we deal with, Alan, is... Um, uh, way ahead of its time. I mean, three-dimensional vasculography is a non-invasive diagnostic evaluation tool that was designed by Dr. Vijay Kumar. He's one of the most brilliant scientists that's uh, ever ever um, entered the arena. Right. He's been described by the person who made the MRI machine as one of the best scientists or leading scientists of our time. Dr. Vijay Kumar. Dr. Raja Vijay Kumar. And, and when when did he invent this? 20 years ago. So it's been around for two decades? It's been around for two decades. Um, actually, it's not a technology that was sold to everybody. It was actually made for military and aviation use. So if a soldier was injured in the field, the machine was used to evaluate them and w by Wi-Fi technology transmit the information beat per beat to a hospital. A doctor would then tell the paramedic how to infuse medication into the patient, wow. look at the response, and then stabilize the patient and transport them to hospital. So, so okay. invented and made for military purposes. And aviation use. So it right. was used for patients or, or candidates who wanted to become pilots. If you wanted to become a pilot in some of these countries, what would happen is you would be put in th uh, or put through this test, and then we'd put you into a simulator, let your body undergo a significant amount of G-force, then bring you back, test you to see if you're a good candidate to become a fighter pilot, or else the, the government would spend millions on a, patient, a person, employ him as a fighter pilot, and then he would die of a heart attack in the air. So it didn't make uh, sense to allow a person to become a pilot without testing them with this technology first. Could uh, external counterpulsation be viewed as a screening mechanism as well? You mean uh, three-dimensional vasculography? Yeah. Three-dimensional vasculography is um, a sort of st a screening tool, but it's more advanced than that. Uh, right. as, uh, as I was saying to you, we have uh, recently tested a technology for the Russians uh, known as virtual light scanning. Virtual light scanning. Which is a, three, which is a screening tool for genetic uh, programming and genome programming and it will also tell you your phenotype in, ter in, in terms of how far down the line you are with certain types of diseases. Okay, so hang on. So the Russians invented this thing. That's right. What, do you look at a screen? Well, actually you look at a, a, a computer screen. A monitor? Okay. Yeah, and you're looking at what we're going to go into this. Well, you know, <laughs> I'm next fascinated <laughs> by this. <laughs> we just published uh, two paper, international papers with 60 patients done in South Africa, which what would happen with uh, virtual light scanning is if a patient has any sort of pathology, your body would uh, then see color changes. So a, a diabetic patient would look at a white wall and see a slight yellow tinge to it. So what the Russians did was basically they took every different pathology in the human body, found the color association with that pathology that your eyes would see, right. and then quantified the degree of variation of color perception. And it, from that, it will literally, literally tell you your genetic programming and how far down the line you are for every organ of your body. So it could pick up from your skin to your bladder to your That's intestine right. to your liver, kidney. Everything, thyroid gland, every, every part of your body. But three-dimensional vasculography is much more in-depth than that. Right. Three-dimensional vasculography is an evaluation tool which gives you numbers. It literally calculates the amount of blood flow in your heart. It literally calculates the amount of blood flow in your microcirculation. And why is that important? Well, basically, how do you advise a patient on what to do, or which modalities of treatment to undergo if you don't have sufficient information to give them information by? Uh, Three-dimensional vasculography would, would measure everything from your hemodynamics, which is blood flow, mm. your stroke volume, cardiac output, systemic vascular resistance, blood pressure. It would measure your cardiac timing, 
autonomic nervous system predominance, which is your risk profile. Most patients want to know what's my risk, uh, either to plan their life or, or their insurance or to see what they need to do. But so I'm, I'm, go ahead. I'm just fascinated by this because, you know, what you're talking about makes so much a sense. The traditional cardiac practitioners, how are they making these assessments? Do they have other tools, other forms of equipment that can measure blood flow and and provide the similar type of information that uh, the uh, e- the equipment you have, um, you know, in terms of external counterpulsation and the uh, three dimensional th- vasculography. and three dimensional vasculography. Yeah, that's a very good question, Alan. Uh, look, our tests that we had previously were good tests, like angiography, stress tests, thallium testing. These are still good tests, but the amount of information they give you give us is very limited, and they're geared more towards anatomy than physiology. Um, there's no test in the world that gives you the information that three-dimensional vasculography gives you. Mm. For example, as I said, the blood flow in the coronary arteries, um, early stages of air retention in the lungs, fluid, air retention, retention, right. fluid retention in the lungs. One would want to know, for example, we spoke about sinusitis, mm. or we spoke about um, patients having problem with the sinuses. A simple things like fluid dripping down your nasal passages, entering the lung while you sleep. I know that I've heard in your show that's not possible, but we've seen it. Well, we had an ENT who, yeah, I know. who sat in and that chair and said, right, there's no post-nasal drip. So right? I, I, uh, from, the, from the patients that we've measured, we've seen yeah. very significant fluid retention in the lungs, even if the SVR is low. Now, you spoke about pressure. If a patient's pressure is high, it mm. back pressures the heart, which back pressures the lungs. Hang on. So if, if someone has high blood pressure, mm-hmm. it creates back pressure in the heart. Okay, a good question I should ask you or any of the listeners out there is how, how do you define blood pressure? I mean, some, it's a very common term used by everybody. If somebody says you have blood pressure problem, what, what are they referring to, Alan? In, in, in well, the pressure terms? of the, the, the flow of the blood. Right? See, this is the misconception because that is blood flow. Because if that was the case, yeah. then you would be excited if your pressure was high because it would mean you literally had more blood flow to the rest of your body, wouldn't it? Yeah, but you don't want to have extraordinary high blood flow in your body, right? Actually, blood pressure is resistance to blood flow. So the pressure of the walls against That's right, against the, the flow blood. of blood. So if your pressure is high, your blood flow is low. So you see, this is a very inc- important concept that we don't understand. So external counterpulsation can assist in this regard. External counterpulsation is the treatment that will bring back the elasticity of the blood vessels in the body. So I read That's, an article this weekend, one of the... Um, uh, science, uh, medical journals and where they spoke about external counterpulsation as being a natural heart bypass. You think that's just uh, glorifying it or is it really could be considered as a natural heart bypass? Well, it just depends how you look at it, um, Alan, because if we look at con- conventional treatments, for example, heart bypass surgery, we, yeah. and we take a blood vessel from one part of the body, which we harvest, and we attach it to the aorta and bypass the area of blockage. This is by physical right. manipulation. So that's the bypass. That's the bypass, yeah. literally. Okay, with ECP, what we do is we open up a set of vessels that you are born with, which are called collaterals. So I know most people might not know about this. Your heart has a secondary set of blood vessels. These collaterals are something that grows with you. As your epicardial vessels or your, your, your large vessels start to narrow, it increases the force onto the arteries, which causes the collateral circulation to start opening. If the narrowing of the artery happens over a period of time, it will force the collaterals to open sufficiently. So the day your artery blocks off completely, you will feel slight chest pains, you will feel heat on your body, you will feel sweating. But what would happen is the collaterals will take over immediately. If this were not possible, then the patient will obviously die before their first heart attack. So collateral circulation is what ECP enhances. So we increase the size of the collaterals so you're able to do more work, you're able to perform greater tasks than you could before this all by strapping these cushion pads around the body i think it's more the more it's more important so just explain what so what is the ecp so you mentioned earlier Mm -hmm. the body gets strapped into this right Uh, vincent and des we're going to come to you so just stay on the line uh but i just got to ask dr Mm -hmm. mohan lal this just to physically explain uh what the gadget you know what the what the equipment is like okay basically the ecp machine is a is a is a large machine that you lie on Um, Like a a bed. Like a bed. There's 180 kilograms of equipment underneath it. Uh, It has pneumatic cuffs that's placed on your legs, your calves, your thighs, and your hip region. Inside the machine, there's a lot of IA that's involved. So the machine literally picks up everything from your ECG that's transmitted from an ECG cable onto our monitor. From the monitor into the IA of of the machine itself. And the machine is sequentially pumping blood based on your body's ability to 
um, offload the blood. So when your heart pumps blood during diastole, that's when, I mean during systole, that's when the blood vessels allow blood to flow through or mm. supposed to allow blood to flow through. When you lose elasticity, it does not. What ECP would do is it would wait for the, the blood to be offloaded. As soon as the valve, which is called your aortic valve, shuts, the machine would then compress the blood vessels, which is your femoral arteries, to push the blood up uh, your entire body. So it will increase blood flow to your genital region, your kidneys. So it will increase blood flow to the kidneys. So many patients who have supposed to have gone for uh, dialysis before ECP don't need dialysis after our treatment. And so how long does the treatment take? One hour a day, five days a week for 35 days. One hour a day? Five, days, five a days a week for 35. 35 days. So you're looking at seven weeks. You seven need to weeks. De- but patients that this. we treat from other countries, like all over Africa or yeah. Mauritius or other provinces, generally stay on TLC oh. and it's quite expensive. Medical aids are covering so this? So they do it in 18 days. Medical aids are covering Actually, we have over 20 medical aids that cover ECP currently, okay. but those are only for patients that have gone through everything, literally bypass right. surgery, stents, maximization of medication, and everything else has failed. Then we look at ECP. Dr. Well. Monal, there's so much I want to talk about, but we have two very anxious people on the line and we're keeping them on hold for about seven minutes already. So deep uh, apologies, Vincent. Thanks for your patience tonight. How are you? I'm fine, and you I'm well, thank you. How's Paul Chepson this uh, Monday night? Oh, what a lovely day. Beautiful, Vincent. How can That's we help? Long time. Yeah, can I ask uh, Dr. Monal a question? Yeah, Dr. go Mohanlal? ahead. Dr. Yeah. First of all, I must commend you because listening to you with all that experience, you are actually, I know all your input, I'm sure you are going to benefit from it, correct? <laughs> Thank you, sir. Yeah. Dr. Monal, what I want to find out, okay, I underwent uh, triple bypass about 14 years ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, what I would like to find out, when I had a fair attack, and uh, while well, immediately I had a discipline, because in of experience my dad had, then uh, we tried to contact the uh, uh, ambulance and so on. But what I would like to find out, when they started to pick me up or get me to the hospital, I, I became normal, so the pain subsided. Now, what I would like to find out, why is that when they do take you to the hospital or they put the ECG machine in you during the time, they can't pick anything up, and it happened to other patients also. Uh, when or how do they really pick it up? Because I had eight days, it was the eighth day when the doctor really to see, you know, if you see that I've got a problem. Is there any other way that you can see when a person has an attack? So, sorry, I didn't get the last part of your question. You see, uh, when you have an attack, normally they use an ECG machine. Mm-hmm. But what happens, say you have an attack at a certain time and later you feel normal. Okay. When they put you onto the machine and they can't pick anything up, it happens, I don't know if other also so post the incident can the ECG machine pick up to say you know what you you know what uh, as we were saying before the ECG is a very good tool mm. as a confirmation tool the ECG would only change if the patient has a significant um, attack where there's damage to the myocardium or there was still significant ischemia to the myocardium right so this is as the patient says himself it's a very common phenomena but if someone has an MI right I mean mm-hmm. is it does, does it depend on the severity of it well, oh. it does because. Um, so the ECG, if you had a mild it, myocardial infarction, will it, that it may it may not pick it up. And okay. in patients who have undergone stress ECGs, have undergone angiographies, were given a clean bill of health. A lot of them we know actually died one week later, or two weeks later, because wow. these are not early detection tools. They are verification tools, like your blood test. Your blood test would confirm if the myocardium was damaged, mm. if the myocardium was insulted for a short period of time and regained its, its normal mode, uh, mode of functionality, there would be no changes to the blood sample. There would be no changes to the ECG. So this doesn't necessarily mean that there was no damage, I mean, no um, pressure on the heart, that, that, that there was no event that, that actually caused the patient to feel this way. It right. was not psychological, if, that, if that's what we think. Okay. Does it answer the question, Vince? Uh, thank you very much, Doctor. I really appreciate you. All right. I think, Mr. Vince, uh, one of the things that, um, as we say, three-dimensional vasculography would actually be able to tell you if the degree of blood flow in your heart has actually decreased during that period, which other conventional tests will not be able to tell you. So we can actually confirm if the reason behind you feeling the way you did was coming from a cardiac-related problem, a blood pressure-related problem, a firing mechanism problem of your heart, or some other cause. All right. Thanks, Vincent. Uh, down in Port Jefferson. From the uh, south coast of KwaZulu Natal up the north coast. Uh, Stanger next. Evening, Des. Uh, good evening. Uh, I just want to tell you about my experience. Uh, you know, if your 
Celestial is high, or Yeshua is high, it's nice to have uh, an angiogram. Over the past weekend, I spent two nights and I had it done. Mm. It's not painful, and it's very, very beneficial. All arteries are clear. But as I say, if you're over 58, 59, it's recommended you do it. Well, what's your take on that, Doc? Uh, actually, I, I sorry to disagree with you. Um, doing an invasive procedure just to check doesn't make sense to me. Uh, I think one would adopt a most or least invasive procedure first. So a non-invasive test would be what I would recommend. An angiogram is a very good test. Um, is no bearing with cholesterol. If that's what one is worried about. But saying that you should undergo a procedure like just for a routine test, I cannot agree with it because the side effects to it, uh, it damages the kidney, the dye damages the kidney. Mm. And this is a known fact. Why did uh, you have the angiogram uh, test performed, Des? I had a, I had a blockage about eleven years ago. Right. And did you have a stent inserted? No stent inserted. So you had a blockage, and then how did they treat it? Uh, when they did the angiogram, they flushed it, and the arteries opened out. Okay. So you mean they did angioplasty? Yes. Yeah, see, the, uh, the thing is that if it was necessary and you were feeling symptoms and they went in, they found this, then that was good. But to, to, to say to a patient that you should do this routinely doesn't make sense to me because of the, of the, of the possible complications. I mean, we've had patients, I'm, I'm part of that team for years. We've had patients who, who had perioperative infarcts. That means they had a heart attack while we were doing the case. We had patients that yeah. lost their limbs because of angiography. Um, we've had patients who have loss of eyesight for eight months or permanently in some eyes wow. because of angiography. So I, I'm not putting the procedure down. I am all for it, provided it's done on the right patient at the right time. All right, Des, does it answer the question? No, thank you very much. Thanks. Right. Thanks for You're welcome. Thanks. Take care of yourself. <laughs> Cheers. And our final call tonight from Johannesburg is Radhi. Good evening, Radhi. Good evening. Oh. Um, can I speak to Dr. Pete? Yeah, he's right here. Go ahead, Radhi. Hi, um, sorry, I just caught your, your conversation right towards the end of, of, of your last comment. Mm -hmm. um, in regards to the post nasal drip, um, I just want to comment on that. My husband had a post nasal drip for the last five years. A post nasal then, drip? I talking about a, a post nasal drip, Radhi? Yes, a okay. post nasal drip, which, right. which, which, which was diagnosed as a post nasal drip. Yeah. But um, eventually they had found out that he had mesothelioma, which accumulated fluid in the lung. And eventually, when he actually went and had it extracted, they had lost four pieces of fluid in the lung. Yeah. Which they were unable to pick up. What they detected throughout the years was that he had a post nasal drip and they were treating him, him with nasal sprays and this and that and that. When in actual fact, there was a, an accumulation of fluid in the, in the lung, and he was diagnosed with mesothelioma. So um, I, I think I think your comment in regard to the um, post nasal drip um, actually, as, you know, causing a fluid accumulation in, in the lung is one hundred and one percent true from my personal experience. Right. So uh, thank you, ma'am. Was one thing I've learned to to do in my course of my practice is never argue with the patient. Uh, they will teach us more about the human body than we've studied in any book. And how's your husband doing now, Radhi? No, no, no. He's passed on, unfortunately. Oh, sorry to hear that. My, my condolences. Yeah, he's sorry. passed on. 13, 14 months ago. Okay. But uh, like I said, you know, he was being treated for for uh, mm. cruelty and, and, and um, uh, you know, posting the drug for years. Yeah. When actual fact, it, it, it was something else completely. Sure. But there was, you know, there was the irritation, actually, there was a nasal irritation mm. and all of that that went with it. And uh, eventually they had to do a pyrectomy, which, which, she survived, and he survived like 14 months after that, and then he was diagnosed with mesothelioma, and and passed on from that. Anyway, Radhi, listen, thank you, my dear, for calling in and uh, sharing that information with us. I appreciate your time. So what I'm saying is, you know, don't don't just diagnose a process or just or accept that mm. diagnosis because that's not. And there's definitely more to it than just a process of. Good advice, Radhi. Thank you. thank you so much, my dear.
God bless you. And that's uh, Radhi from Joburg. Uh, I did say that's the last, but we'll take one more in a second. Let me just tell you, tomorrow night on Tuesday Showcase, here on Walk the Talk with me, Alan Khan, we we'll chat to literary champion Daryl David and acclaimed writer Professor Ashwin Desai about Durban's recent honour of being named UNESCO World City of Literature, which is a first for a city on the entire African continent. So Daryl David, Ashwin Desai, tomorrow uh, for the hour between 7 and 8. Let's take our last call now. We're staying in Johannesburg. Indar Ahir is here. Evening, Indar. Good evening, Doc. Hi. Good evening. I've heard some wonderful news with regard to the wonderful work you've been doing. Congratulations. Thank you. Some of the people that I know personally have been seeing you. And uh, I, as much as it's greatly appreciated. Um, Thank you. What... Okay, a silly question. You know... How can I say it? What are the guarantees that comes out of some of the good work that you are doing? So, in other words, my question is, has anybody had any negatives with regard to what's come out of what you've been doing? Okay, so interesting question. Any negatives attached to external counterpulsation and three-dimensional vasculography? Well, with the three-dimensional vasculography, it's completely non-invasive. Uh, right. We literally don't, I mean, we wouldn't touch a patient in terms of applying any pressure or um, <clears throat> significant amount of change to the body. So you're saying no so side effects? There's no side effects. With right. ECP, uh, some patients will feel like they've ran after a long time, after the first few sessions, uh, because it literally uh, works your body to such a large extent. Uh, some patients may find uh, slight marks on their legs because of, of uh, if, if the cuff creases at any part, but it would be a small line that would go away, mm. a small abrasion. Um, personally, we have not found serious problems or complications with ECP because it's known as one of the safest treatments. In you the haven't world. had any patients pass pass on on, well, on on the table? Well, we've had a patient that actually passed on because, um, I'm being honest about this, because yeah. he had a shrapnel that was in the lung uh, that the patient omitted telling us. Right. Um, and it migrated during the treatment into the into the oh, lung so itself. It got dislodged from it. From so it caused it an embolism, and uh, with an embolism, it, there was there mm. was no time to resus a patient like Sad. that. But generally, with ECP, with the conventional cardiac patients, no matter how severe they are, mm. we've had patients who were having literally a heart attack, and we carried them from the floor, put them on the bed, treated them, and they are fine today. All right, in the thanks for that. Uh, well, well done, doc. Thank Last you, question. Forgive my uh, forgive my persuasion on it. Okay. Uh, as much as I appreciate it, like I said, I had people that are personally involved with me that are uh, your patients. Okay. But uh, uh, somebody that has had something like strokes and strokes upon strokes, um, does this not have? Any, what are the side effects of the fact that when you do the treatment that you are doing, if it does? N- you know, for example, it has a clot somewhere. Mm-hmm. Is it not going to clot. then return to the heart or to the brain mm-hmm. and cause any side effects or any consequences of the treatment that you are doing, which I know and I've seen and I believe is fantastic thus far? Okay. It's a good question, sir, because most of the medical professionals ask us the same question. But if one understands how the body works and the physiology of fluids, if, if one had to hold water in your hand and you squeeze your hand tightly, water would move through the area of least resistance first. So it, w- so it would come out of your palm of your hand and not through your fingertips or your, the, the center of your finger first, so, or your fingers first. So this will tell us that in the body, when we increase blood flow to any part of the heart, literally the blood literally moves to the area of least resistance first. So if there is a natural blockage or a, a piece of plaque or, or a loose plaque that's moving, it would go to the area of least resistance first and prevent uh, these phenomena from occurring. So the chances of dislodging a plaque... Uh, unless it's something that a shrapnel that's loose in your body is very, very rare during uh, ECP. Right, and thanks for the call tonight. Appreciate it. And that's uh, our call. So if you did get through to Enrico and he took down your details and we don't get to call you back, uh, sincere apologies. We only have 10 minutes with Dr. Mohan Lal and we still have a mountain to get through. So each case is unique. And you did mention if you are type 2 diabetic, if you hypertensive, maybe just categorize this now. Uh, what types of cardiovascular patients could benefit most? And let's start with ECP treatments, okay. external counterpulsation. So basically, uh, as I said, you know, patients who have chest pains right. um, associated with heart problems, shortness of breath. Um, with females, we mostly have shortness of breath first. Remember that 
this, the frightening part about females is that they don't feel as much pain as men. Mm. Uh, contrary to the fact that we thought we were weaker for <laughs> a long amount of time, we found out now that men have one third the pain receptors as ladies. Uh, that was made by nature or God because of childbirth. Uh, so obviously women don't feel the same uh, symptoms that men would. So they won't feel the the um, uh, chest pains or severe chest pains that you you would feel. They wouldn't feel pains to the back. Pains radiating down the radiating down the left arm. Until it's much more severe. Until it's much more severe. So right. at an early stage, they will probably feel slight fatigue, at first, and then shortness of breath. So these are the things to look at, look for in patients. Patients that have shortness of breath, fatigue, unexplained fatigue, uh, chest pains, uh, angina or, or chest pains. That's what that's what we call them. Mm. Uh, patients who have high blood pressure, diabetes. Um, these are the common things that 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 will. Uh, that that we would look for in a patient. Remember that a patient can come to us before any surgery, yeah. after surgery, after stent insertion. So those have already insertion. had a myocardial infarction. You could still see them. Yeah. The, the the point is that after myocardial infarction, the collaterals would open, and we would be able to enhance this collateralization. And the thing that 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 we need to identify using three dimensional vascularity is mm. the cause of the 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 patient's symptoms. Is the patient's symptoms coming from the fact that there's insufficient blood flow? to the heart muscle or the fact that the heart cannot offload the volume of blood in it. Let's use the analogy of a car. If you've got the engine and the exhaust system, the exhaust system is made in direct proportion to the engine's capacity. If you narrow the exhaust system, this would back pressure the engine. Eventually the rings and bearings would break. If we replace the rings and bearings, this will power the engine up for a short period of time and it will break again. And this is the same thing that happens in bypass surgery. If we don't identify the root cause of the patient's symptoms, and we treat only the symptoms. For example, if we fix only the engine, so if we repair only the heart as a single entity mm. and not dilate all the blood vessels in the body, the back pressure that it would cause would damage the heart again. Any patients who wouldn't be considered uh, safe for ECP? Well, patients who have uh, aortic valve insufficiency that's severe, where the aortic valve is leaking sufficiently mm. uh, or severely, uh, these patients would be able to identify using echo cardiography or three-dimensional vasculography as well. What about those with uh, atrial fibrillation? Patients with AF, uh, if their heart rate is below 108, they would benefit sufficiently from our treatment. But if the patient's heart rate is too high, we generally use beta blockers to lower the heart rate and mm -hmm. then look at treating them at that stage. Okay, so um, in our remaining moments, I just want to go back to three-dimensional vasculography. Um, it's, a, it's another first for South Africa that you have at your center? Yeah, it's a first for the African continent. So nowhere else in Africa... Can you go for three-dimensional vasculography? Yeah, and one of the patients always tells me this is the saddest thing ever because when I die, it's going to go with me. So, what, so what's the reason that it's, you know, not that I'm complaining it's here in my hometown in Durban, but, you know, why is it not more widely used around the country and around the continent? Look, with, with any new technology, it takes time for it to be used. Um, you know, I, I've presented to many forums like uh, Doctors' Association forums, International Forums, Saudi Heart Association meetings, Health Professions Council. Uh, Heart and Stroke Foundation and some of the biggest hospitals around here. And one of the common um, description of the technology is that it was very advanced and it, it uses a completely different approach, a new dimension of thought as compared to what we've been educated so with. So there's a resistance to adopting new technology? Well, to a degree there's a resistance, Alan. There's also education that's required. Because, you know, Apple iPhone 10 comes out and there's thousands of people all around <laughs> Apple stores around the world queuing <laughs> for the new technology. You know, here's something that is going to, not purely for entertainment and media, but can benefit your health and well-being. Uh, the resistance doesn't really come from the patient's health. Um, we've, the medical fraternity. It, it initially was like that. But today we've, I've done the test on more than 700 mm. patients myself. Uh, many of those patients are doctors, um, GPs, um, cardiologists, nurses, heart surgeons, um, from every medical uh, facet. So now we find that they've understood the technology. Well, they've understood I, the need. I know the Director General of Health invited you as a guest speaker uh, to one of the, uh, the functions, the MEC of Health. So, you know, there seems to be, I don't want to use the word wide acceptance, but more people are aware of the technology. Yeah, actually, um, more people want to be, to understand what this technology is about. Uh, they've been hearing a lot about it. So will, from, we find it, patients. will we find it in our public health system then? Can we expect to see this well, in state well, hospitals? That, that's the intention, um, because I don't believe a technology like this should be kept for me alone. I don't believe it should be performed by me alone. And the saddest part is if a technology like this had to dwindle in time because uh, it is not monetarily um, 
how should I say, it's, it, it doesn't bring back the money as one would want it to. Um, but the information that it provides and the ability for it to help people is is overwhelming. I mean, it should not be lost because of that reason. What's the general accuracy, accuracy rate of uh, 3DVG? Well, a study done in Maryland, USA, uh, by the National Institute of Health in 1991, shows that it has an uh, accuracy of 91% with a positive pre- predictive accuracy of 98%. Uh, this comes in way ahead of any of the other technologies that was evaluated, for example, stress ECG, uh, tellium testing, um, angiography, any of the other tests that are out there at that time. So in terms of patients, who would benefit most from uh, 3DVG? I think it would be anybody who has a hereditary um, uh, list of problems, for example, as we said, all the pathologies that we spoke about uh, earlier, uh, patients that want to evaluate themselves before and after a procedure. Patients that want to identify whether a procedure would be a good idea for them or not, so they want to know the risk profile. So it could almost be a second opinion. Yeah, literally a second opinion, because one doesn't want to undergo an invasive procedure and then find out later that that wasn't the right procedure to go for, because that's a one-way ticket. Remember that after you've been for an invasive procedure, there's no going back. But you can always do a non-invasive procedure and still do an invasive procedure after mm. that. Any uh, side effects, just to uh, to quote what uh, Indira had mentioned, uh, in terms of uh, three-dimensional Vasculography? As I said, uh, three-dimensional vasculography is non-invasive. The, patient, right. the hardest thing for a patient to do is lie still in a bed for five minutes at a time. So what happens during a session for three-dimensional vasculography? Well, a patient comes in, they lie on a bed, um, we strap them. I mean, we attach a set of signal generating and signal receiving platinum con- superconductors on the patient. Platinum superconductors. That's right. Right. And we use a device called a vertical acceleration device that's similar to what's used in tsunami detection. That's from Back to the Future, wasn't it? Didn't Marty McFly have one of these gadgets? Something like that. Particle accelerator. And it it yeah. literally can, can basically identify low-intensity um, signals that's fired through the body. So it uses signal wave modulation and flow turbulence accelerometry to, da- to basically create a three-dimensional mathematical model of the heart and then runs a simulation for 256 heartbeats and then superimposes the information onto the 3D model to give you all the information that it does in a 23-page color report. And the test results are available immediately? Immediately. I, I would then evaluate the report and um, give the patient our advice based on the report. So you interpret the results? That's right. Currently, I'm the only person in Africa that's trained to do this and certified to do this. Are you training someone else? We are. We are in the process of training okay. others. As I said, you'd be sad to die with this technology. And in terms of uh, some of the results, what are the more common results that your patients uh, are, are leaving your rooms with? As I say, the, the, the most common results that we find amongst the Indian population is high systemic vascular resistance. And that's caused by arteriosclerosis, which is loss of elasticity of blood vessels, which is very common, which is a precursor to heart disease. I mean, um, I don't know if you have the time, but one of the biggest fallacies uh, that we've been led to believe is that heart problems is caused by cholesterol. Cholesterol is produced in your body in large quantities. Mm. It's something that's used to help your brain function. So we need cholesterol. You literally need it. It's been made for a specific purpose. It floats in your bloodstream. Hypothetically speaking, Ellen, if you were cholesterol and you were floating in the bloodstream, would you attach yourself to something that moves the most or something that moves the least if you wanted to have a rest? Possibly something that moves the least. Like the heart? Possibly. No. Because the heart is moving all the time. Yeah, so you'd want to rest on something that doesn't move, not like the heart. Am I right? Mm. It would be more like something like the brain. So why doesn't the brain brain block off first? Why does the heart block off first? Or the liver. Yeah, or the liver. Secondly, mm. Mm. Um, if, if something were thick and flowing down arteries, would you expect it to block off a big part of the artery first or a narrow part of the artery first? So I'll tell you what, right? Since we've spoken about external counterpulsation and three-dimensional vasculography, you've impressed us with your particle accelerator <laughs> platinum <laughs> gadget on your... Superconductors. <laughs> and you've been strapping everything. Uh, we have to have another conversation around cholesterol because I think that's a whole separate show that's altogether. True. That's true. Rakesh Mohanlal, Dr. Mohanlal, thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank uh, you. We're creeping up to 8 o'clock. If someone wants to reach out to you uh, to explore this fascinating... African first. The only place in the continent you're going to get it is with Dr. Mohanlal. How do they reach you? What's the website? Well, our website is www.counterpulsation, C-O-U-N-T-E-R-P-U-L-S-A-T-I-O-N.co.za. Right. And you're based in Amshlanga? In Amshlanga. In Durban. Or the old-fashioned way, you can pick up the telephone, landline 31 <laughs> Is that correct? That's right. That's 31 566 
0567-104-5617 or go online to worldwideweb.counterpulsation.co.za. And I but guess they can look at the testimonials on the website as well. Fantastic. Listen, always a pleasure to see you. Thank you. Uh, let's don't leave it uh, for another three years. <laughs> but you, you're getting better with age, I must add. <laughs> it's you. nice I'm to so see so someone else you. losing a bit of hair. <laughs> I'm not the only one here. I mean, you know, Lloyd's looking... Uh, Check Lloyd. I mean, it's unfair that someone looks so smooth all the time. You know, Enrico, as always, is smiling. Thank He's got you, his new you. JBL headphones on. And, of course, the gorgeous Navita Gajrad standing by with her lime green uh, jeans. Very fashionable tonight. Uh, here I'm sitting in my double breast suit. I'm just an old Looking bullet. Looking You think so? Looking great. All right. Thanks, Rakesh. Thank you very ha- much. Happy Howard. holidays to you. Thanks to your team and all the listeners out there. Bless God bless. You. Thank you so much. God bless you too. It's a minute after eight. That's my lot tonight on Medical Monday. Tonight's show was produced by Enrico Pele. If you want to reach out to us, anyone in your family, friends.